Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Food History Happy Hour. I am your host, Sarah Westbrook Johnson, also known as the Food Historian. Um, we're trying a little bit of a new format tonight, so let me know what you think. And as always, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and drop them in the comments and I will do my best to answer them as we go. So tonight we are going to be making a cocktail called the Gin Daisy from a 1902 um, bartender's guide called Recipes of American and Other Iced Drinks. So it's a British publication, but because it's not been so beastly hot, <laughs> um, I thought we could try some. Of course, today now uh, Tropical Storm Fay is headed my way so it's not quite so hot as it was um when i decided to make this drink but that's okay because it looks interesting hello neil welcome um it's a little bit complicated and it has a little bit of a history behind it so it calls for let me just pull up the recipe here hi carla to make sure i have it right it calls for um or geet or or jot syrup or gum syrup uh three dashes of maraschino juice of half a lemon a wine glass full of holland gin which is maybe a little much for me um and then you fill it with seltzer water which i realized i just forgot <laughs> my seltzer water is not up here that was foolish of me um so I'm gonna run and go get that. So I'll be right back. I'm really sorry, you guys. I always do this, but there's a lot of ingredients in this one. And it does have a little bit of a cool history behind some of the ingredients, so I'm gonna share that in a minute. But I'm gonna go get the seltzer. <laughs> Hi, Heather, welcome to your first Food History Happy Hour. <laughs> yeah, so this is a new format for me. Um, I think I may have set up live captions We'll see. I'm trying new stuff out. Um, send Sweetie to retrieve it. I wish I could send Sweetie to retrieve it, Neil, but she's not up here with me today. She didn't want to come up and participate in Food History Happy Hour this week. So I'll be right back. I'm going to run and get the seltzer, and then we'll make the gin daisy. Okay? Hold on. I'll be right back. <laughs> I can't believe I forgot it. Okay, Sweetie Pie has changed her mind. She... It's joining us. Come here, puppy girl. You don't want to come up? You okay? No? All right, never mind. Maybe she doesn't want to join us. <laughs> anyway, sorry about that. There's a lot of ingredients, so I can't believe I forgot the seltzer. Anyway, who am I missing? I'm so happy the captions are working, you guys. Um, I have to say thank you to brand new Patreon patron, Liz, who just joined today. She actually sent me a bunch of really great suggestions for the show, including that I should try and get captions on there. So I did that. Um, so you can definitely thank her for that. She also suggested this new service um, that has all kinds of fun stuff we can do, including I can have guests on the show now, believe it or not. Um, Neil, you never answered my question about whether or not you wanted to be a guest on the show. <laughs> anyway, hi, Eleanor. Hi, Marty. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Sweetie Pie is thinking about coming back up. Sweetie, you can come up. You want to come upstairs? There she is. You want to come say hi to everybody? Come here. No? Oh, <laughs> Hear you. Oh goodness. Say hi to everybody. Everybody, this is Sweetie Pie. If you're new to Food History Happy Hour, she's our little mascot and she likes to hang out on the bed. <laughs> Next to my little table here. So that's Sweetie Pie. 
Neil, you don't have to be a guest if you don't want to be a guest, okay? It was just a suggestion. Hi, Matt. Yes, you got to see Sweetie Pie. Okay. Whew. New format. I'm getting all flustered. So we're going to make the Gin Daisy from 1902. So the Gin Daisy is a fairly old drink. Um, it's in a class of coolers, gin coolers, uh, with the Tom Collins and all kinds of fun stuff like that, the Lime Ricky or the Gin Ricky. But uh, I ran across an article that referred to it as boat gin. So like it's supposed to be so weak that you can barely taste the gin. Um, that is not the case with this recipe. Uh, this recipe calls for, if I do a whole wine glass, spoiler alert, I don't think I'm going to. If I did a whole wine glass of gin, that would be four ounces of gin in one cocktail, which is a little much for me. I prefer my drinks to be more like on the two ounce level. Um, it also calls for Holland gin, which is also known as Jennifer, uh, which is a little bit different than traditional gin in that it's often made um, with malted liquor. So it's a little bit similar to whiskey, but it's got a lot of juniper in it. So I don't have Holland gin. So I thought to kind of approximate it, I would do regular gin, American gin, actually, technically, because it's my favorite. Um, and then I'm going to put a little bourbon in it so that it approximates that kind of malty, malty flavor that's supposed to be in there. <laughs> and of course, Neil is already giving us um, a recipe for orgeat or orgeat syrup. So I did look up a little bit of history. I didn't make an approximation. The recipe for this gin daisy calls for either orgeat or gum syrup. I didn't have any either of those things. Um, gum syrup, I believe, has gum arabic in it, and it's just kind of um, got a little bit of like a thicker mouthfeel to it. So I just made a simple syrup, and I put a couple drops of almond extract in it because orgeat um, traditionally actually was kind of uh, an emulsification, emulsify, was emulsified, if I can speak today. Um, originally with barley, right? If you've ever had barley soup or barley water, you know it's got kind of like a little bit of thicker mouthfeel. Um, and, uh, sorry, people are commenting. <laughs> And it was later, they replaced that with almonds. So you got a little bit of almond oil in there. And then eventually um, it kind of got standardized that it was um, a syrup made with almonds, orange flower water. And some people also added like brandy or vodka or other alcohol. So I didn't have any of that, but I thought I would approximate the flavor by making just a simple syrup um, with a couple drops of almond extract. Because of course, traditionally called for bitter almonds, um, which give it that real almondy flavor unlike modern sweet almonds which are kind of almondy flavored but not really so anyway that's a little bit of a history behind the ingredients and then of course also maraschino syrup which has its own history i'm not going to get into but um definitely not so much cherry as it is pomegranate which is kind of fun so enough chit chat i think i am just going to go ahead and get started um, Neil's telling me in Dutch that he doesn't have any Holland gin. I think that's what he's saying in Dutch. Don't speak Dutch, but it's close enough. All right. So the recipe calls for, um, crushed ice, which I don't have. I'm just going to use regular ice cubes because that's how we roll here on Food History Happy Hour. And, um... Yeah, I'll maybe say, it doesn't say to put any in the drink. So I guess I'll leave it out and we'll see. Oh, where's my recipe? It's a little bit complicated, so I don't have it totally memorized. All right, it calls for chipped ice. It says three or four dashes of orajat. So I'm just gonna say that that's like, maybe a little more than a spoon, right? Uh, and then, the same, right? Three dashes of maraschino, which this is, I'm not going to dash with this because it's just open. So I'm going to do the same. I'm going to just do like, like a spoon. 
So it'll be a little bit pink. For those of you who are new to the Food History Happy Hour, um, I have unintentionally made a pink drink just about every time I've done this show. <laughs> so again, I didn't intentionally make this a pink drink, but that's how it turned out. Uh, and then it also calls for um, the juice of half a lemon, uh, which of course I forgot. <laughs> We're very lucky that that fits. I forgot to have a little thing to put lemon juice in. So. This is one of my favorite kitchen gadgets, although I guess technically it's a bar gadget. It's called the Juice-O-Matic, and it's, the Juice-O-Matic was patented in 1939, so this one is probably from 1940, which you can tell a little bit by the styling. So, I have a fresh lemon, oh my goodness, that doesn't usually happen. Make myself some room here. And the Juice-O-Matic is great. They still make versions of this, for commercial juicing, you can still get hand juicers like this, but I love that mine is from the 40s. I wouldn't want to have to juice a lot of lemons with this, but if you're just making a cocktail, it's totally awesome. Ta-da, that's what it looks like. All right, I'm so happy that glass fit because I really didn't want to leave and go somewhere else again. Okay. I'm sorry I'm missing all your comments right now, you guys. You're just going to have to wait. <laughs> oh, see what I mean when I said it was complicated? There's so much stuff to keep track of. Okay, and then it did, it did call for a wine glass full of Helen gin. I don't, I'm debating if I should measure with a jigger or if I should just try and go for the wine glass. I guess I'm going to just go for the wine glass, and we're not going to fill it up because that would be ridiculous. But... Maybe we'll do like half a wine glass and we'll put oh, just a splash of bourbon in there to kind of approximate some of that maltiness. All right, am I missing anything before I shake? I am not. So in that goes. Get this out of the way. Oh, I need a bigger table, you guys. <laughs> All right. Whew. Got some breathing space again. Okay. I'm always so worried with the pink drinks that this is going to, like, come open and get pink whatever it is all over me and stain my outfit. All right, now it says to use a large cocktail glass. So I don't, I, I don't know if I mean like a brandy snifter or what, but I think I'm just gonna use the wine glass maybe rather than this one. All right, let's see, is it pink? It is pink. Oh yeah, that doesn't leave very much room for seltzer, does it? I think we're gonna have to use the other glass. Now let's see if I can transfer without spilling. Ta -da. I am gonna put an ice cube in it just because I hate warm drinks. Okay, I don't have plain seltzer. Um, so I'm using lemon lime because that's what I had, but it does call for, uh, Apollinaris, that's how you pronounce that water, as an alternative to soda water, and that's a type of mineral water that originates, I believe, in Germany. So, it's kind of like a name brand of water. All right. Whew, recipe can go away. You can see the 8 million comments that I missed. Okay, thanks everybody for joining us. All right, so this is the Gin Daisy. Uh, it's a gin fizz, but it's made with Holland gin. So I approximated that by having American gin with a splash of bourbon whiskey, right? Because that's what I had. Um, it also calls for maraschino, sir maraschino syrup and orgeat, which I approximated with a simple syrup flavored with almonds 
and then it calls for um, a little bit of salt and water. So this is the gin daisy. Let's see how it tastes. It's very strong. <laughs> I have to say I kind of like uh, that little bit of bourbon in there. It kind of mellows out the gin a little bit. Um, Um, that much gin kind of does overpower all of the other ingredients, so you can't taste any almond. You can't really taste the maraschino, and it's just kind of lemony. So I think if I made it again, which I probably would, um, I would want a little bit more of almond flavor. Um, or try to make my own orgeat syrup, and then I would use less gin. But it's still drinkable. All right, so how's everybody doing tonight? I'm so happy to see so many people watching. That's fantastic. Um, I had a much more restful week this week. <laughs> Not quite so crazy at work, although this weekend uh, is my first weekend physically back at the museum. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so tonight, last week, we had requests uh, to talk about picnics and to talk about camping. Um, and as always, if anybody has any questions as they go along, that's the name of the game here at Food History Happy Hour, that you can ask questions live in the comments and I will answer, answer them to the best of my ability. Um, so which should I start with? Should I start with camping or picnics? Which do you guys prefer? Tell me in the comments. If you're still seeing me anyway. Neil made some comment about the video is freezing. I hope not. We'll see how it goes. All right, well maybe I will just start with uh, picnics because those predate Oh, there we go. Alyssa says picnics. Cammy Alyssa says picnics. So we'll start with that anyway. So picnics um, date back to 17th, definitely 18th century France. Um, it's kind of, the, nobody's really sure of the origin of the word. Uh, some people think it may have referred to people who brought their own wine to restaurants. Um, other people think it might come from the French verb pique, you know, like to pick, which makes sense. Uh, but it came to be known as a gathering of people where everybody brought, everybody brought their own food. So more like a potluck. And then gradually it shifted to being more and more about outdoor dining. Definitely by the time we get to the 18th century, it's all about outdoor dining. And it tends to be the purview of the upper class. So anybody who reads um, Regency novels, <laughs> like I do if you're a Jane Austen fan, um, definitely the English aristocracy was engaging in picnics. And there's lots of references to the picnic hamper. Now most of you are probably familiar with picnic baskets and the picnic hamper is really like the granddaddy of picnic baskets. Right. It's a large wicker stash in it. The traditional beverages for picnics um, are not gin daisies, sadly, although I'm sure they do make an appearance in the later 19th century. Um, but things like claret, uh, if you're really wealthy, you might have some champagne. And then also things like uh, lemonade, ginger beer, uh, beverages like that sort of special beverages. Not so much tea, although that did happen occasionally. Uh, and then all sorts of foods that could be served cold. So in aristocratic England, that was things like um, boiled or smoked tongue, hams, um, cold chicken, um, and then all sorts of like breads and cheeses and fruits and things like that. All the kind of traditional picnic-y type things that we think of. But because it's aristocratic England, I mean, definitely there were people probably sitting on blankets on the ground but you had servants, 
to bring all sorts of things along. You might have a tent set up, right? You might have tables or chairs, folding chairs brought along. Um, but as picnics make their way into the middle classes, and particularly in middle class America, they tend to be more, more simplified, right? So instead of a giant hamper, you get the picnic basket. Um, things like ham and smoked tongue and cold fried chicken still definitely persist as picnic foods. Uh, and a lot of the cookbooks, the 19th century cookbooks that do talk about picnics, and particularly the early 20th century cookbooks, they really emphasize foods that are easily transportable, foods that don't need, you know, knife and fork or spoon <laughs> to be consumed. Like, don't bring soup on a picnic, probably. Um, so things like hard-boiled eggs, and then you hear about um, bringing a twist of salt, right, a little um, piece of fabric, or later on they use wax paper. You make like a little cone and pour the salt in it and twist it up. So you can sprinkle salt on your hard boiled eggs, um, stuff like that, cakes without frostings, things that are easy to eat with your hands, that kind of thing. Um, that all persists in picnicking. And I think we talked last time or in a previous episode about the influence of the Hudson River School of Art in kind of getting people in the United States really interested in wilderness areas. So, you know, the stereotype of picnicking in, in England and in Europe is that you're going into like these very bucolic areas, you're sitting on the grass, it's like beautiful rolling countryside with big shade trees. Um, and that does happen later in the 19th century America, but around the time of Thomas Cole and the Hudson River School, we're talking about like 1820s and 30s, uh, people were really going into wilderness areas and in search of the picturesque and the sublime, um, which also has to do with camping, which we'll get to in a minute. But so there was often a little bit more rugged areas that they were going into. So the camping, or sorry, the picnicking was not quite as refined. Did also find some interesting references um, to, let me pull it up here so I get the name of the battle correct. So during the American Civil War, uh, residents of Washington, D.C. went to Manassas, Virginia. So it's on July 21st, we're close, 1861, uh, to watch the first major battle of the Civil War. So people were bringing picnics, it's also known as the picnic battle, people brought picnics with like opera glasses to watch this battle because they thought the Union soldiers were just gonna destroy the Confederates and then the war was gonna be over. And that is not how that battle goes at all. Um, it does not go well for the Union forces. The picnickers kind of have to like flee um, and the Union troops retreat and a lot of the civilians who had come to observe the battle uh, kind of have to hustle along back with the troops. So, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting moment in American history. There's also a little bit of a disturbing aspect to picnics among white Americans in that some people, not a whole lot of evidence, but some people, there is some evidence that people may have picnicked at lynchings in the United States. Um, so that's another weird thing that people did. Uh, hangings, lynchings were kind of public affairs. They were sometimes celebratory. Women and children came to them. Um, again, no concrete evidence that there was actual picnicking going on on a regular basis, but it would not surprise me, frankly, if that happened. The 19th century in particular um, is kind of known for picnicking in the late 19th century in particular. A lot of it is associated with um, Protestant churches and like church picnics and potlucks and eating out of doors. Um, a lot of people are doing it for recreation in the 19th century to kind of get out of the cities and towns where it's cooler in the countryside, someplace maybe where there's water, um, you know, kind of beautiful areas. And part of that involves picnicking in rural cemeteries. So in the 19th century, there is a movement to 
move burial grounds out of basically the historic downtown areas out of churchyards and into kind of bucolic rural areas. And part of that has to do with the sensibilities at the time, but part of it also has to do with um, an interest in improving sanitation. So this may be a little bit gross, but cemeteries were seen as um, originators of miasma or bad air, which most Victorian people at the time thought was the originator of disease. And urban cemeteries were really getting quite crowded by the time we get to the mid 19th century. Um, you know, every time you're burying somebody, you might end up digging somebody else up. If people were not buried properly, you know, their graves might be sinking, maybe some bones are showing, there was concern about contaminated water supplies, things like that. So there was a real effort to move cemeteries out of downtown urban areas and into the countryside. And part of that was that they were set in these beautiful park-like settings, which then attracted people to go out and visit them. I think over Memorial Day weekend, we talked about Decoration Day. That would have involved picnics, people going um, in late spring and cleaning up graves, um, bringing flowers, things like that, and they would be picnicking. Which in a lot of cultures um, that have, have real interest in uh, honoring their ancestors, that's part of their culture also. So it shouldn't be surprising to Americans that we used to do that. But anyway, those are my interesting thoughts about picnics. Let me just check the comments here. Oh, Heather, I'm glad you thought that the gin daisy was interesting. I will just tell everybody that's new uh, to Food History Happy Hour that I do eventually post on the blog on thefoodhistory.com and I post the recipe um, in the blog and I usually also link to the original uh, bartender's manual that I found it in. So I will post the original recipe and then also basically what I did, which often I end up kind of editing a little bit depending on what ingredients I have. Um, but you can definitely see those on the blog. And I am very proud of myself because I had extra time this week. I did get through the backlog of all of the old episodes. So all of the episodes um, until last week are up on YouTube and all the blog posts are up on the website. So if you want to review any past episodes, that is definitely the way to do it. Oh, Johanna, I have to tell you, Jin, Johanna says, you inspired me to pour some gin. <laughs> I'm so glad you're joining. Um, I have not traditionally been a very big gin fan. I think I've said this before because my first introduction to gin was gin and tonic and I hated it. But it turns out what I hated was the tonic, not the gin. So I'm a big fan of gin drinks that don't involve tonic, like this one. Awesome, Heather. I am so glad you're joining us tonight. And Heather says she's drinking her beverage next to her 1905 gramophone. So very appropriate that we have a 1902 drink tonight. All right, any questions about picnics? Before we move on, I didn't get too much into picnic food. Uh, we could talk a little bit about potato salad, <laughs> which I think is considered a picnic food here in the US. Um, I was involved in a very interesting uh, Facebook flame war, kind of, not really a flame war about picnic salad, or sorry, potato salad, wow, uh, in which several people were claiming that there is only one true potato salad, which I kind of disagree with. Um, I think all potato salads are delicious, except for the, you know, joke kinds that have raisins in them. Don't put raisins in your potato salad. But so the approved potato salad recipe was the holy trinity of um, peppers, onions, and celery, very finely chopped with diced potatoes, diced hard boiled eggs, um, mayonnaise, mustard, and sweet pickles. That was supposedly the only true way to make potato salad, <laughs> which sounds like a perfectly delightful potato salad, um, but I disagree with that a little bit. Um, I didn't grow up eating that much potato salad, and a lot of commercial 
potato salad like you get from the grocery store is just much too sweet for me. Um, I love my alcohol sweet. I do not love my potato salad sweet. Um, I did not grow up with that kind of potato salad. So I, I enjoy French potato salad, like vinaigrette based potato salads. I enjoy German potato salad, which is a um, bacon fat and vinegar based type potato salad. I enjoy, um, you know, traditional mayonnaise and mustard based potato salad, provided it's not too sweet. And I really enjoy my mother-in-law's potato salad, which does not have eggs. So if there are any hard boiled eggs, haters out there. Sorry, Neil, I disagree. Potato salad does not have to have hard boiled eggs. It isn't potato and egg salad. It's potato salad. So potatoes are really the only required ingredient in potato salad. Everything else is negotiable in my opinion. Um, but my mother-in-law's potato salad recipe is potatoes and shaved sweet onion with mayonnaise and sour cream and white vinegar and dill and it's delicious. I really love it, so it's fairly addictive. <laughs> Neil is having opinions about potato salad in the comments. If anyone else has opinions about potato salad, it's a surprisingly controversial topic. I was surprised. I love all potato salad, not equally, but I love all potato salad. I make a French potato salad that's um, basically salad nissoise with like everything <laughs> taken out of it. <laughs> so it's just boiled potatoes and green beans and like a Dijon mustard vinaigrette. You can put hard boiled eggs if you want. You can put tomatoes if you want. If you want to make a salad niçoise, add some tuna and the tomatoes and hard boiled eggs and some olives if you want and there's your salad niçoise. Otherwise I just like it with potatoes and green beans. <sighs> ah. But anyway, potato salad is a fairly standard, I think, picnic food in the 20th century, but not so much in the 19th century because um, we don't have prepared mayonnaise as much, so it's a little bit more difficult to make. We do, however, have boiled dressing. So if anyone out there is in the Miracle Whip camp, right? I used to love Miracle Whip when I was a kid. I don't so much anymore, I think, because it's a little too sweet, although I feel like I should try it again just to make sure. Um, but boiled dressing, let me get out my trusty dusty Fanny Farmer here. Um, Miracle Whip is based on boiled dressing or cooked dressing. So if you've ever seen generic versions of Miracle Whip are called, um, let me see if I can find it. Sometimes it's called salad dressing or every once in a while, if you have a British section, you'll see Heinz salad cream. Right, that's all in there. Okay, watch. I'm I'm pulled out trusty Dusty Fanny Farmer, and I bet it's not, not in here. <laughs> oh, give me a second to look it up here. It wasn't under boiled dressing, so now I'm looking under cooked. We'll see if it's under cooked dressing. Nope. All right, we're just gonna go to dressing and see what comes up. Nothing. Fanny Farmer has failed me. We're going to go to salads next. There it is. Salad dressing boiled. I knew it would be in here. $2.89. Okay. So boiled dressing is salt, mustard, sugar, cayenne, flour, melted butter, two yolks of two eggs, milk, and a little vinegar. So um, you cook it in a double boiler, right? So it's not really itself boiled, um, but you're using the eggs, you're using cooked yolks as a thickener. It's almost like how you would make pudding or custard basically, but you're adding um, vinegar and sugar and spices and flour, and that makes uh, a dressing that you can put on all sorts of things, but traditionally it's used um, in like coleslaw and potato salad and things like that where you want a creamy, a thick creamy dressing. Um, it's a little bit, I think, more stable than mayonnaise um, in terms of spoilage, but that is kind of the precursor to mayonnaise in 
creamy salads. So that's kind of where Miracle Whip comes from. It's got that sweet, kind of sweet sour thing going on. <laughs> Heather talks about Dukes. Yes, Dukes mayo, Dukes mayo in there or it's not allowed south of the Mason-Dixon line. Ironically, one of the people I was arguing about about what constituted the best potato salad said she only used Hellman's, not Dukes, and she lives in the South. I enjoy Dukes on tomato sandwiches, which we talked about last week. Um, I'm not picky about mayonnaise and salad. Definitely the creamier, the better, but you can kind of approximate it a little bit with sour cream. I know that's probably sacrilegious for people who live in the South, but guess what? People who don't live in the South have a hard time getting a hold of Dukes. It's not available in stores up here, sadly. However, I have had it in India's. Very good. Oh, interesting. Neil says salad cream mentioned in Victorian sources consisted of hard boiled eggs pureed with cream, mustard, salt, and vinegar. I mean, definitely egg sauce, like creamed, like a white sauce or other creamy sauces with diced hard boiled eggs in them are a thing. Um, but pureed, that makes sense because the stuff I'm seeing commercially is very yellow. So if it had pureed hard boiled eggs in it, that would explain why. All right, any other questions before we move on to camping? No, I am just gonna do a little interjection if you're just joining us here on Food, Has Food History Happy Hour. I'm drinking the Gin Daisy from 1902. It is very alcoholic. Don't think I'm gonna be able to finish it. It's also probably why I'm looking a little flushed. Um, but that's okay, we just got done talking about picnics and we are going to move on to camping, I think. So, um, I did pull up a couple of cookbooks, which if I still have them open, I do, I can drop them in the comments here. Oh, I got rid of that one. All right, so one of them was uh, Maria Parloa's Camp Cookery, and which I don't have up, so I can't drop in the comments, but I will drop this other one, which is the one I was trying to find last week, and I still can't find my hard copy of it, but this is a 1910 um, version, also called Camp Cookery. Um, but it's by a man named Horace Kephart, who who is also the author of Camping and Woodcraft, The Hunting Rifle, etc. So it's kind of an interesting gendered look at camping. So um, Maria Parloas is from the 1870s, I think 1874. I'm gonna look it up now because it's gonna drive me crazy. Yes, hers is called Camp Cookery, How to Live in Camp. And it was published in when? 1878. So hers is definitely all about provisioning and cooking in camp and like the kind of cook stoves to bring with you, which I kind of think is cheating a little bit. Um, and uh, Horace Kephart's is more like, here's how you clean game. <laughs> and his is, is very like, you know, carry everything in a pack with you uh, and be camping for a lot longer. Maria Parloas is a little bit more like, um, this is you you're going away for the, like one night and it's fun. Here's what you should bring with you. So I'll drop, I did find this one. So here's Maria Parloas too. So camping, like I said earlier, dates back really in the United States to um, like the Hudson River School of Art and this kind of appreciation in the United States, this burgeoning appreciation in the United States of the wilderness as a beautiful place that you wanted to explore, this sublime, fascinating, awe-inspiring place that you wanted to explore. So here in New York City in the Hudson Valley, the Catskill Mountain, Mountains became a very popular destination for wealthy people from New York and Boston and Philadelphia and places like that um, to come up and kind of experience the sublime. 
and they're doing this from the 1820s, you get some early people coming up, but really it's the 1840s and 50s that um, this interest in wilderness and kind of this preliminary interest in camping um, gets started. It's a time period in American history when we have peace and prosperity for white people. <laughs> um, and people have leisure time. Um, the middle class is rising, right? We're becoming more of like a mercantile uh, society. Um, and people have the time and the means to explore. We're also still kind of a new nation and we're still kind of figuring out what it means to be American. We have a little bit of a chip on our shoulder about Europe and we wanna compete with them in terms of our landscape and our resources and our culture. And so there's a lot of interest in domestic travel as well as travel abroad. And there are also a lot of Europeans coming over to kind of explore this new nation and figure out, you know, what it's all about and what America is all about. Um, so you do definitely have a lot of mountain houses in the Catskills and elsewhere where, you know, they're like these giant hotels built up in the wilderness. So if you didn't want to go camping, you didn't have to. But people are hiking and exploring and some of them um, are going camping. Neil makes the point that there are fewer ticks <laughs> at that time. I think there definitely were. People did wear a lot more clothing in the wilderness, so I think maybe ticks just didn't um, proliferate as much. But also, if anyone remembers last week in our talk about uh, deer and carrying capacity, there just weren't as many wild animals around, I think, for ticks to proliferate on. And also, um, climate change has made tick populations worse in the United States. So no, not as many ticks. So much better time to be out and about. Although I'm sure they had just as many mosquitoes and biting flies and all that other fun stuff. So after the Civil War, uh, in the 1870s, you get people um, start to really be interested in like Yosemite and the Rocky Mountains, right? We now have train travel across the country. So there's a lot of interest out there and you do start to get more and more hiking and sort of nature exploration and people who are camping. And so that's kind of where Maria Parloa's cookbook, I think kind of fits in. People who are going away for a weekend, who wanna go camping, who wanna go experience wilderness. Um, she's making these recommendations for people like that. And then her introduction is really interesting. She First she gives advice about taking a tent Right, what she talks about can be hired of any of the sale makers, right? So here we have people who are making sales for sailing ships are also making tents at the same time. And I ran into a couple of references that were like, oh, the camping tent wasn't invented until the 1850s. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what were they doing for the entire 18th century, including the Revolutionary War? They had tents back, back then too. Like people were sleeping in tents. This is not a new thing. I mean, maybe the 1850s and when, is when you started to get commercially produced camping tents. I don't know. But anyway, that was a little fact check. <laughs> um, and this is a very interesting thing that she talks about. I'm just going to explain it, even though it doesn't really have anything to do with food. Because I've been camping. And anyone who's been camping in a tent, this probably would be good advice. So she talks about dig a trench around the outside of the tent to avoid nocturnal baptism the first time it rains. So if you've ever been in a tent in a really bad rainstorm, you've seen all of the water that collects on the floor of the tent. But according to her, if you dig a trench, then the water, instead of pooling on the ground and coming up through the bottom, if you dig a trench around, it's gonna run into the trench and drain away from the tent, which, you know, digging a trench for camping is not probably allowed in most um, parks in the United States today, but it seems like it'd be a good idea. And then she says the beds, right? You should put rubber blankets on the ground and then the beds should be board beds, slightly raised for the head and sloping to the ground at the foot. And then you can put straw or hay or dry seaweed I guess if you're beach camping, and then the blankets. And then she says, everything used about the bed should be laid in the sun every day, right, to disinfect and dry out. 
So that I just find is fascinating advice and not something that you would probably see in a lot of modern um, camping tomes, I guess. Yes, Matt, it's a tent moat, right? If it rains, it'll just go into the little moat you dug. It's like you have your own little castle. So her cookbook is not very long and it's fairly simple. She does talk about camp stoves, right? So I looked up some of the stoves that she references and I couldn't find examples of any of them, obviously, but I'm guessing they're like the little teeny, like you've ever heard of like a three dog night stove. They're very small stoves on little legs, right? Freestanding, kind of like a Franklin stove, right? A very, probably only have one or two burners on it. Um, and it doesn't take a lot of fuel to fire it up. So she references that. She references digging into um, a bank to put the stove in, I guess, to protect it and probably to prevent fire. And then she says, definitely do not bother to bring crockery or china, make everything tin. Another interesting thing that she references is that the coffee and tea spots should not have spouts, but lips, right? So if you've ever seen, you know, the classic blue and white enameled camping coffee pot, it doesn't have a spout. It just has a little teeny lip kind of bent into the top of it, right? And I think that's because um, it's easier to pack for one, but also it's not going to, it's easier to clean and it's not going to bend or break off if you're carrying it in the rough. Um, but I thought that was a little interesting thing that I probably would not have thought about. And then she has a number of game recipes. Um, so she talks about birds, she talks about chicken, fish, right? If you're going camping, you're probably going to be doing a fair amount of fishing, although most of it is for ocean fish. Um, but she does talk about um, brook trout and salmon and things like that. Um, she mentions specifically a clam bake, which, you know, that's a very New England thing dating back to indigenous people, really. So she explains how to make um, a clam bake for a large crowd. She talks about clam chowder and oysters. So this, I guess, is seaside camping. And then, of course, eggs. Um, cured meats and beef, mutton and lamb, all that fun stuff. And then the vegetables are pretty straightforward. It's potatoes, onions, maybe if you have squash, beets, shell beans, things like that. Um, and then rice, macaroni. She does mention tomatoes. Uh, and then my personal interest is in the bread. So she talks about corn doggers, sorry, corn dodgers. Um, oatmeal, hominy, griddle cakes, lots of griddle cakes, spider cakes. Um, for those of you who don't know, a cast iron fry pan on long, thin legs is called a spider. And it's for cooking over an open fire. Um, and then the desserts are very simple. It's a lot of puddings and apple downy, right, which is um, kind of like a dumpling-based dish. Um, uh, and then she does have a couple of cakes, but they're all designed to be, they're like, sh you bake them in shallow pans, and I think you cook them pretty quickly. So that's only if you bring a stove with an oven, I guess. Um, and then the drinks also are very straightforward. But one interesting one she has is uh, a recipe for something she calls mead, which is clearly not, you know, like honey-based Viking mead. It's um, brown sugar and molasses that you add boiling water to, and then you put tartaric acid and sassafras essence in it. And then to use it, you cut it with water and soda, and you drink it while foaming. Interesting, so it's like homemade, homemade soda pop. And then interesting, she does have for the sick at the very end, and one of the, the first recipe is rice water for diarrhea. So if you're camping and you're not careful of your water supply, <laughs> what to do if someone gets sick? So the other interesting recipe I want to mention from this cookbook, um, which I found fascinating and I kind of want to try at some point, although I probably never will because I don't hunt, so I won't ever have this. But she talks about birds roasted with their feathers. 
So you kill and clean the inside of the bird, right? You take out all the entrails, trails, drain it of blood, all that stuff. Um, and then it says you cover it with wet clay and bury it in the hot coals. In 40 minutes, draw from the coals and peel off the clay. Um, the feathers and skin will come off also. And then she says, a gentleman assures me that they are perfectly delicious when cooked in this manner. So I thought that was fascinating. Anyway, so Kenneth here, <laughs> his is arranged very similarly, um, but he has a lot more recipes. Um, and he does also talk a lot about fresh game meats, right? So how, how to clean and cook um, fresh game, which I found interesting. So anyway, those are my little food related camping things. Don't mock me, Sarah Fortman, for saying soda pop. Soda is not a super descriptive term because sometimes it means unsweetened salts or water. So I say soda pop to the benefit of our non-Northeast um, viewers. <laughs> oh, Sarah also says Native Americans use clay to roast game fowl as well. And she's offering to have her husband hunt for me. That would be fantastic if only you didn't live so far away. All right. So that's what I came here to discuss tonight. Does anybody else have any questions for me? We've got about um, eight to 10 minutes left. So if you're just joining near the end, this is the Food History Happy Hour. I'm Sarah Wasberg Johnson, also known as the Food Historian. Uh, I made the gin daisy from 1902 with my fake Holland gin and my fake orgeat syrup. <laughs> um, so yeah, if anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and drop them in the comments. Um, you can also, if you care to, I mentioned earlier that all of the back episodes are now up on YouTube. And if you want to follow me on Facebook or on Instagram, I have a cool scrolly thing now at the bottom of the screen. So I'm at Preserver Parish on Instagram, The Food Historian on Facebook. Um, and you can also visit me on my website. And if anyone would care to join Liz as a new patron on Patreon, please feel free. Um, it helps keep this show free and all my blog posts free. Um, for the general public. Oh, Rita, great question. Thank you. When did dehydrated backpacking food become a thing? So definitely I think people traveling with dehydrated food is a very ancient um, thing that happens, right? So indigenous people in particular on the Great Plains, which is my neck of the original neck of the woods. I live in New York now. Um, but pemmican, right, made from bison meat uh, and berries and fat, that was like ancient indigenous energy bar. But dehydrated foods, um, I think really got kind of a boost during World War I because Germany in particular um, was kind of known for provisioning its soldiers with dehydrated foods. Now, whether or not that was actually true uh, that was what the American media was talking about at the time. Um, so Neil mentions pocket soup, a mixture of diced dehydrated vegetables um, that could be reconstituted in water and made like a de decent soup. Julienne soup um, was a version of this that was very popular around the turn of the 20th century and during World War I. Um, but I think really the type of backpacking that you're talking about um, where people are like buying equipment and buying specialty foods really doesn't start until the 1970s and particularly into the 1980s. Um, as we can see from Maria Parloa and, uh, oh, I'm forgetting his name. The other guy, <laughs> is it Kenneth? Uh, um, Horace, 
Horace Kephart, they are both writing uh, camping based cookbooks with the expectation that you're going to bring cast iron equipment with you and if not have an open fire, at least, um, you know, bring the equipment, sorry, not having a, an actual stove with you, bringing the equipment that you could cook um, over an open fire. So I think the dehydrated stuff really gets a start in the 70s when we start to get more interested in backpacking. But I think also probably influenced by World War II and Meals Ready to Eat, MREs, uh, and field rations, uh, and things like that. Um, so yeah, oh, Johanna says, I wonder if companies like Coleman or L.L. Bean had something to do with it. That's a good question. I mean, definitely those companies were around in the 30s and 40s. Um, definitely people were buying their products to go camping, to go fishing, hunting, those kinds of things. But I think the real dehydrated foods, I don't know, I feel like those don't come around until later because a lot of the references you see to camping in the 40s and 50s, they're, you know, if you're traveling light, you're gonna bring like salt pork and cornmeal and maybe some eggs. You know, <laughs> like they're not talking so much about dehydrated soup um, and stuff like that. But I think probably meals are gonna eat memories and World War II played a ref, uh, role in that because we did a lot more experimenting um, with how to have these ultralight rations. I think probably also some of the craze around uh, the space race and astronauts, you know, like astronaut ice cream and all the dehydrated, freeze-dried foods that they were taking into space might have played. You know, what we think of as like backpacking, like when you're hiking, you know, the Adirondack Trail or you're going up in the Rocky Mountains for weeks at a time and you're, you're doing ultralight camping, I think that's not until um, much later later in the 20th century good question though great question yes neil how did i know you're going to mention tang i almost mentioned it so tang right is developed i'm pretty sure for the space race for astronauts um i think by the same guy who invents cool whip i'm pretty sure in the 1960s so yep and dehydrated orange juice doesn't really taste like orange juice, though. All right, any other questions for me? No? I didn't talk about ice cream this week, you guys. I didn't have time. Um, I did, Neil sent me the Parmesan ice cream recipe that I thought about making but then i was like do i really want to waste like two cups of heavy cream on an ice cream that i might not enjoy <laughs> so instead i made more romagrat ice cream um which i think i put the link to in last week's food history happy hour blog post um but i literally had that for dinner yesterday because it was so hot i didn't actually want to eat real food Matt, what are you talking about? I don't know what that word is. I'm going to Google it quick. Oh, okay. So I'm not sure how you pronounce it. I'm maybe boucan, boucan. Sounds French. Um, a frame for drying meat over the fire or the dried meat itself. I have not heard of that. So thank you for introducing me to a new term. Oh, it's related to barbecue. Yeah. I didn't realize that original indigenous barbecue was dried meat. That makes sense. I mean, definitely, uh, if we're talking about dehydrated food, sailors for a very long time subsisted, I think, on a lot of dehydrated food, like dried salt cod, things like that. Ooh, Neil brings up brown bread ice cream. I have to tell you, going through all of the blog posts I did to go with the Food History Happy Hours where I have links and the recipes and all kinds of fun stuff, 
um, reminded me of the episode where I talked about grape nuts ice cream, and I have to keep reminding myself, I have to put on my grocery list to buy grape nuts so I can make grape nuts ice cream, which I think is a relative of brown bread ice cream, which Neil mentioned in the comments. So, all right. Well, this has been an awesome Food History Happy Hour. Thank you so much to our new viewers joining us tonight. Um, I think I'm going to sign off for the evening because we're at almost exactly 60 minutes. So I do try to keep it to an hour. Um, as I said before, my name is Sarah Westbrook Johnson, also known as the food historian. Uh, you can find past episodes and learn more about me and the kind of things I do at thefoodhistorian.com. Or you can follow me on Instagram and Facebook. Or if you really love Food History Happy Hour, you can join me on Patreon at The Food Historian. Um, I've decided I'm just going to keep doing these forever until you guys tell me not to. <laughs> So you can join next week and every Friday at 8 o'clock Eastern right here on Facebook Live. Um, and hopefully we will see you all next week. All right. Have a good night, everybody. And thanks so much. Mm -hmm.